described as forever chemicals, representing a public health and environmental crisis of epic proportions. Present in virtually every living creature on this planet, it may well be the most dangerous chemical contamination that we have ever experienced. We're assembled here this evening um, as a prelude to action that we all must take for the sake of our families and of our grandchildren. We assembled here this evening representatives from four of Pennsylvania's more prominent environmental action organizations committed to taking action. Clean Water Action, Conservation Voters of Pennsylvania, the Delaware Riverkeeper Network, and the Southeast Chapter of the Sierra Club. Also represented here is the Bucksmith Coalition for Safer Water, a local Bucks Montgomery County organization leading all of us, representing one of the most contaminated communities in the nation. We've also brought together tonight leaders representing both sides of the aisle in the Pennsylvania House and Senate who have taken an action to introduce cutting edge legislation to address this issue. The Attorney General is with us here tonight and um, for whom um, many of us are here after having watched in the film, we have Attorney Robert Billet, whose story is chronicled in the film Dark Waters and described by the New York Times as the lawyer who became DuPont's worst nightmare. The work of his legal career has brought us more than enough information for us to act and make, make action on this. It's now up to us, those of us presenting tonight and those of you viewing tonight, to take the action needed so we can do what needs to get done. Some housekeeping details. We have muted all of your microphones, but for any reason they should become active, we would ask that you make sure they remain muted. You will also notice at the bottom of your screen the word chat. If you will click there, if you have questions you want to ask any, at any time tonight, post them there. We are monitoring and we will be taking and compiling those questions for the panel discussion phase of tonight's program. If you are on one of the Facebook feeds, you will want to also enter your questions here and the sponsoring organization that you came um, through on will make sure your questions also come forefront. So tonight, without further ado, um, let's begin. First, our welcoming message tonight, I wanna to introduce to you the legislative leaders from Bucks and Montgomery County. Representative Todd Stevens from the Pennsylvania House and from the State Senate, Maria Collette. Opening with Representative Stevens in 2016, when this issue first exploded on the scene, Stevens, a Republican, negotiated with his colleagues and Governor Wolf, securing funding for municipal water treatment program that not only brought the levels of PFAS to non-detect, but now delivers what arguably is some of the cleanest drinking water you're gonna find in the country, a standard we need for all of us. Representative Stevens. Sorry. All right, there we go. <laughs> thanks so much uh, for having me, and uh, and thanks so much for all the organizations who have put this together. This is a, a terrific uh, panel of folks that you have laid out here tonight. It's going to be very informative. Um, you know, I have to give credit to Tracy Carluccio from the Delaware Riverkeepers, who is, uh, who is participating here tonight. She is the first person to come visit with me uh, back, I guess, in 2016 or 2015, somewhere back in there. Um, and open my eyes to the concerns about uh, these chemicals. Um, I had no idea. And I grew up, you know, right at the foot of the runway of the Willow Grove Naval Air Station. Uh, my parents still live in the house. Um, this is a deeply personal issue for me. Um, you know, my community has been at the tip of the spear and uh, we've been fighting hard. Um, we've been fighting, you know, to get the federal government to uh, provide the funding and the healthcare resources that, that we so desperately need. Um, we've also been fighting to eliminate the, uh, the chemicals from our water, and we've been able to do that. And uh, fortunately now, uh, through a, a new program that Senator Collette and I both worked on up in Harrisburg, we're gonna be able to help other communities as well. But we need an MCL, we need uh, standards, not only in Pennsylvania, but across the country. Uh, we see more and more states adopting them, and, and it's through initiatives like this, through the awareness that is gonna be gained through these types of forums um, that people can be armed with the information they need to go to their legislators, their policymakers to make a difference. The same way Tracy Carluccio came to me 
opened my eyes to this subject and got me on board. That's what every single person you know, participating in this Zoom call tonight needs to do. Uh, you walk away armed with tremendous information that you can then go to your policymakers, your lawmakers, your regulators, and make the case for why we need to uh, more strictly regulate these chemicals and remove them from our drinking water. So thanks so much for having me. I really look forward to the informative discussion tonight. Thank you, um, Todd. I want to introduce now Senator Maria Collette. Upon her taking office in 2019, the very first piece of legislation she introduced on Earth Day addressed PFAS contamination crisis. SB 561 would lower the acceptable levels of PFAS in our drinking water to 10 parts per trillion, and SB 582 would classify PFAS as a hazardous substance under Pennsylvania's Hazardous Sites Cleanup Act. These bills will be the first step towards addressing the environmental and health crisis, uh, ensuring that the polluters and not the municipalities and, pay and taxpayers are the ones who bear the cost to clean up our water and soil. Senator Collette. Thank you so much, Maurice. And um, I'm really excited to be here with all of you. Is my volume okay? Can you hear me? Just a thumbs up? Great, wonderful. All right, well, thank you. And thank you to Clean Water Action for organizing this town hall and for bringing Rob Ballot here to share his wisdom with us. I have my signed copy of uh, Mr. Ballot's book and um, it is always a pleasure to see him, although I wish we were talking about uh, other things, but it's really so critical that we do get a chance to discuss this. And thank you, of course, to all of you out there who are joining us tonight. For those of you who don't know me, my name is uh, Senator Maria Collette, and I represent parts of Bucks and Montgomery counties, including all three of the municipalities that have been at the center of Pennsylvania's PFAS contamination crisis. Um, that includes Horsham, Warminster, and Warrington. Back in the 1930s and 40s, PFAS chemicals were thought to be miracle materials because of their ability to withstand extreme temperatures and their resistance to water, grease, corrosion, even UV rays. One of the most common uses was in Teflon coated frying pans and cookware. We know that PFAS are strong compounds and some PFAS are stronger and harder to break down than others. Two of the strongest of these chemicals are PFOA and PFOS. And those happen to be the ones found in the firefighting foams that were used for decades in massive quantities for training exercises at the military bases in Horsham and Willow Grove, and bases around the country as well. To give you an example about the levels that we're talking about here, the EPA has issued a lifetime health advisory limit of 70 parts per trillion. I want you to keep that number in your mind, 70 parts per trillion for PFOA and PFOS. In 2014 and 2015, public water wells on and around the Warminster and Horsham bases were testing as high as the hundreds of thousands of parts per trillion, hundreds of thousands. When it was discovered somewhat by accident in 2014 that public and private water wells in these three municipalities contain dangerously unsafe levels of PFAS and PFOA, our local officials took swift action to take them offline and get residents connected to clean, safe drinking water. Their work was truly, an, truly exceptional. And as Representative Stevens mentioned, the state has taken steps to reimburse these municipalities for the great expense that they and their taxpayers have borne as a result of this drinking water crisis. But cleaning up our drinking water is only one component of addressing the PFAS contamination crisis and having the state reimburse the municipalities only passes the buck from one innocent party to another. We still have 832 acres of contaminated soil in Horsham Township and 824 acres in Warminster Township. The containment process is still in its earliest phase, which means most of the perimeters of these bases remain unprotected from plume migration meaning contaminated surface and groundwater can continue to spread and contaminate other municipalities. We have fish, livestock, and crops being nourished by contaminated food and water sources. And most importantly, as we saw in the movie Dark Waters and the real life story that inspired it, there remain serious health risks to the residents of these communities who drank the water during the 50 some years their firefighting foams were seeping into our public and private wells. And we have not yet been able to hold the people who actually made this mess, the chemical companies in the U.S. military, accountable. 
Uh, when I ran for office in 2018, it became very clear to me very quickly that this issue matters deeply to the people living in the three most affected towns and beyond. I'd walk through neighborhoods near one of the bases and a resident would point out to me all the homes where someone had a rare cancer. They'd talk about their fears of the unknown, their fears of letting their kids play by the streams and creeks in our local parks, their fears of growing a garden and their desire to have their concerns taken more seriously by the government. People were frustrated that the only folks who seemed to care were the local officials and local legislators. They wanted to see quicker action, more accountability, and stronger support at the state and federal levels. The first piece of legislation, as Maurice uh, said, that I introduced after I was elected in November was uh, two pieces, SB 581 and 582, as he mentioned. SB 581 would set an interim maximum contaminant level, or that MCL that we've been talking about, of 10 parts per trillion for PFAS in our drinking water until the EPA or DEP sets a permanent MCL. We know that both the federal EPA and the state DEP are working to do this, but they are moving at a glacial pace, and that is absolutely unacceptable to the people in our communities. We know more than enough now from the work of great people like Mr. Balot and others that we can set an interim MCL. My SB 582 would reclassify these chemicals as hazardous substances. This important step would not only require more stringent monitoring, it would open up more funding and make it easier for us to sue polluters. An incredible attorney, Mark Hooker, recently brought a case against the US Navy similar to Mr. Balot's case against DuPont, but it was dismissed in federal court for this specific reason, that the chemicals were not officially designated as hazardous substances. Attorney General Shapiro will tell you that SB 582 would make it easier for his office to go after polluters too. It's wordplay, a distinction without a difference. We all know these chemicals are hazardous, but without this change to the law, we're stuck. And that means you and I and all of Pennsylvania's taxpayers are stuck with the bill for a mess we didn't make. So where do we go from here? What do we do next? The governor has already indicated that he would sign SB 581 and 582 into law. Last year, I met with Republican chair of the Senate Environmental Resources Committee, and he indicated a willingness to bring SB 582 up for a committee vote, the first step in moving it to the full Senate. Unfortunately, it turned out that corporate special interests had a stronghold over his party leadership, and they stopped him from doing so. At the federal level, we have critical PFAS health study planned for 2021 that will investigate PFAS levels among our community members to better understand demographic determinants and the health conditions for which we may be at greater risk. This study is being funded by federal dollars. The work being done to contain the perimeters and clean up the soil at our local bases is also dependent on federal investment. U.S. Senator Casey and 18 of his colleagues recently wrote a letter to HH to Health and Human Services Secretary Alex Azar asking him to thoroughly study the possible link between PFAS exposure and COVID-19. They wrote that for these communities, it will be vital to gain a better understanding of how exposure to PFAS can impact the risks of contracting COVID-19 as well as the risks of COVID-19 complications or even death. Again, though, the decision whether or not to do such re research is up to Secretary Azar and his department. My point in mentioning all of this is to say that hope is not lost. Elections matter, your vote matters, and the party that holds the majority and makes the decisions about the laws that get heard and voted on matters, even with respect to issues like this that are not remotely partisan in nature. Thank you so much, and I look forward to learning from the rest of our panel members. Thank you, Maria. Uh, our uh, next speaker, um, the uh, Attorney General, Josh Shapiro. Um, Maurice, how are you? Can you there hear me? You are. Okay, I'm very well. I was gonna give you an introduction, but I have no idea what to say. Why don't you take it away? <laughs> Well, that was the kindest introduction I've ever received, Maurice. Thank you uh, very much. And it's good to see so many friends and uh, so many neighbors on this call too. I'm your neighbor in Abington. And um, while I represent obviously the entire Commonwealth of Pennsylvania as your attorney general, um, this is home. And um, these are the issues that 
my family and I see day in and day out. I want to, before I share just a few thoughts with you, and, and I'll be brief because I think it's important that we hear from Rob uh, and others. I, I do want to thank Senator Collette uh, for her leadership. Uh, she's been in the Senate for a short period of time, but has had a massive impact already on this and so many other issues. I also want to thank Representative Stevens, who's been dogged on this issue uh, and, and really determined to bring back resources and help to the community. So uh, to Maria and Todd, uh, my friends, thank you very much for the work that, that you do for all of the people on this call and the people of Pennsylvania. Um, and Rob, I want you to know, I was on the phone with Mark Ruffalo just the other day, and we talked about the fact that I was going to be on this event. Um, you're far better looking than Mark, I have to tell you. And I'm really looking forward to hearing what you have to say. You know, Mark and I were having a conversation about uh, the work I had just done through my office to hold the fracking companies accountable in Pennsylvania. We filed, for those of you who don't know, criminal charges uh, against um, three companies. Uh, and released a grand jury report that detailed very clearly, and I hate to say this, but a complete dropping of the ball by our regulators in Pennsylvania, by the DEP and by the DOH, the Department of Health. And while they've made some progress in that area, those grand jurors thought that there needs to be real systemic changes to our laws in order to uh, protect public health and protect our environment. I wanna thank Senator Collette in particular, who I know is looking to advance uh, some of the work those grand jurors did. I bring that up because the story of the work that um, the grand jury did, and I will tell you there is more to come and more charges that I'll be filing, but the story there is very similar to the, the PFAS story. It's a story about a big, powerful corporation having their voice heard in our state capital and state capitals around the country. And the people who live next to a site, the people whose health is compromised, the people who have to see this industry take away their land, those people oftentimes are powerless. Those people oftentimes don't get a say. They don't have lobbyists and they don't have lawyers. Well, here in Pennsylvania, they have me as the people's attorney general. They have some of the elected officials who are here who are willing to fight for them. And they have all of you and organizations like Clean Water Action and people who care deeply about our planet, people who care deeply about public health. PFAS, I believe, is going to be the environmental issue for the next century. It is going to be a story about corporate greed. It's going to be a story about those powerful interests run amok. But ultimately, it's going to be a story about the people of Pennsylvania rising up and saying, we're going to reclaim our land, we're going to clean it, and we're not going to allow for this type of destruction of our communities to happen again. You know, here in Pennsylvania, most folks don't know this. You have a constitutional right to clean air and pure water. It says it right there in Article 1, Section 27. And so Maria made a point in, in her comments about, you know, this isn't a partisan issue or, you know, a Democrat, Republican issue. She's right. We all take an oath to support the Constitution of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. You all are citizens of the Commonwealth and you deserve these rights. And it is our responsibility to protect our air and water and to ensure the health of the public and to hold these powerful interests accountable. My office is going to continue to do that work, whether it is the company companies that brought PFAS and these uh, other contaminants into our state. And while I can't get into details of what we're doing, I can tell you we're working very, very hard to hold them accountable and return some real resources to the community to clean it up. Or whether it's the fracking industry or others who continue to undermine that Article 1, Section 27 constitutional right that you all have. Know that I am fighting my tail off for you. My team is working tirelessly for you. And that if we continue to work together, lawmakers, law enforcers, and advocates like Clean Water Action and, and others, and smart people like Rob, then we're gonna really make a difference um, in our community. The task falls to each of us to do our part, and we're gonna to continue to do that. So Maurice, um, I'm gonna turn it back to you. I look forward to the discussion, uh, and I appreciate everyone's time here tonight. I wish we were together. Uh, I wish you all uh, good health and, and safety, and I look forward to seeing you in person real soon.
Thank you, Josh. Thank you so much for your work. Um, you're the chief cop. You take care of the, you take care of the environment and the people that live here, and we appreciate that. Next, um, I want to introduce uh, Tracy Carluccio. She is the deputy director of the Delaware Riverkeeper Network. Uh, Todd mentioned that he first heard about this issue from her. Um, she came and visited me as well when I first started my work on staff here in 2016. She's also worked with our, our chapter in New Jersey. So um, in terms of if there was a dean on this subject among us, it would be Tracy. Um, let me turn that over to you, Tracy. And what do you have to tell us? Okay, oh, thank you for that introduction, Maurice. So um, Pennsylvania has the PFAS problem. We've heard that and that's the bad news. But Pennsylvania can fix the problem, and that's the good news. Uh, in December of 2019, Pennsylvania announced the re results of the first round of sampling that came out of Governor Wolf's PFAS action team. At the governor's press conference announcing the results, a disturbing conclusion was prematurely drawn that spells trouble for Pennsylvanians, we think. Quote, the results do not indicate widespread PFAS contamination, end quote, read the press statement without explaining that the scope of sampling was very limited. With that foreshadowing, whether or not there will ever be a statewide mandatory safe drinking water standard adopted by Pennsylvania that requires the removal of all PFAS from our water was thrown into question. Despite earlier DEP statements, the governor made no commitment at the press conference to adopt a safe drinking water standard or regulate these highly toxic compounds as hazardous substances or face uh, the military and force them and other sources to remove all PFAS from the environment that they polluted. So far, the only regulatory action by DEP has been a proposed rulemaking, not yet approved, to set cleanup standards for free PFAS compounds. But the standards are based on the US EPA's health advisory level, or HAL, for PFOA and PFOS, issued back in 2016. DEP and the military also use the EPA HAL of 70 parts per trillion as a trigger for taking a water supply offline or requiring remediation. But it is well known that the HAL is not accepted by many as protective of human health. States are adopting standards as low as eight parts per trillion for PFOA in Michigan, 10 parts per trillion in New York today for PFOA and PFOS, and 13 parts per trillion in New Jersey for PFOS, all based on current science. Pennsylvania is participating in some meaningful studies and national research conferences. And of course, it's essential that the government sample drinking water sources to locate where the PFAS are which are being found and at what levels. But what is the excuse for planning in April 2019 uh, to take until June 2020 for phase one of the sampling, especially when considering they haven't even stuck to that slow motion schedule? They promised to publicly release the laboratory results on a quarterly basis until the sampling is completed this June 2020. But we have seen nothing since that first report last year and June has come and gone. And if they believe it's so important, why such a limited study plan to start with? The public has only seen the results of 96 samples when DEP has identified 493 public water system sources as potential sites. And that's only a fraction of the 9,200 public water systems in use in Pennsylvania. And this doesn't even include, and let me emphasize this, any private water wells. Most obviously, why didn't DEP start long ago? They first found out in 2013. Delaware Riverkeeper Network submitted our petition to the Environmental Quality Board more than three years ago for a safe drinking water standard to be set for PFOA with robust scientific references they could have used. If the state had started acting then, we could have adopted a standard by today and be well on our way to complete PFAS regulation. Michigan took about two years to come up with their adopted PFAS standards and like Pennsylvania, they had never adopted a drinking water standard before. Actually, in my organization's uh, opinion, Delaware Riverkeeper Network, 
the nonprofit Buxmont Coalition for Safer Water is doing more community protection work through cutting edge research than anyone else in Pennsylvania. And our legislators that are here tonight have taken tougher stands and more meaningful action than DEP has. In reality, there is already ample evidence in Bucks and Montgomery counties where 100,000 people have been exposed and from the other water systems that have already been tested to move ahead now with recommended MCLs, safe drinking water standards. The harrowing revelation discussed at a Pennsylvania Department of Health meeting in 2018 that people who live around the military bases in Bucks and Montgomery counties were found to have elevated levels of PFOA, PFOS, PFHXS and PFNA and their blood should have been enough to incite regulatory action by the state. It should have given the agencies the sense of urgency that they are shamefully lacking. The fact that many of these residents have been drinking PFAS contaminated water for decades with the toxics building up in their blood should have lit a fire under DEP, but instead, Bureaucratic dawdling continues, and we either seem to be facing another three to five years before any drinking water standards, uh, or uh, based on current signals, perhaps no standards at all. Every day that passes without safe drinking water standards is another day that Pennsylvanians continue to be exposed to the risk of developing a disease to which these highly toxic compounds are linked. And it's another day that Pennsylvania is abrogating its responsibility under the Environmental Rights Amendment of the Pennsylvania Constitution. The time for action is now, more accurately, yesterday. We hope Pennsylvania is finally ready. So that's my take on where Pennsylvania is now regarding PFAS. Thank you, Tracy. Let me just take a breath. I want to introduce now Hope Rossi to speak to us. Hope um, doesn't just know this subject, she has lived this subject. She grew up across the street from the Warminster Naval Base um, and worked there when she graduated high school. She has lost family um, to, to this and she has suffered herself with multiple surgeries all related to this. She is one of our heroes. She is among those of us in the environmental groups, greatly revered. I want you to know that as we hold people to be involved in this, to work together on this event, every event, every leader of each group asks me the same first question. Have you talked to Hope? Is it okay with her? Um, well, it is. Hope you are at the point of the sphere. We've got your back. Why don't you talk to us? Thank you, that was very nice. Thanks all for attending and all the people who took time out tonight to be here. I think it's super important for you all to be here and hear and understand, and, and it is complicated, it's not simple. Um, the, the most important thing, and I'm gonna just reiterate it once again, that Tracy and Maria and Todd and um, Al, and I'm sure Rob's gonna also say, is that until we have laws, it's up to us as citizens to protect ourselves and our families. Um, so you, we, due to um, I'm sorry, due to uncontained plumes in Bucks and Montgomery County around those air bases, both bases still remain to have these plumes that are huge and they're leaking into uh, drinking water sources. So it's important to know where your water comes from, whether you have a well, whether you have public water, it's important to be educated um, and get your water tested if you have a well and know that the regular well testing is not enough. You need a special company in a lab to test your water and it costs a little bit extra. So I'm going to just start, Maurice gave you a little bit of background on me. Um, I grew up in Warminster across the street from the Navy base and we lived right where, right across from where they did the firefighting training where the PFOS that was used to put the fires out um, went into the ground. I mean, we also inhaled the smoke for, I did for many, many years. We, I lived there since birth. Um, we watched daily firefighting. My family had a private well where whatever was on the, Na on the Navy base came right into our well on our front lawn. We were about 25 foot from the Navy base. 
and not only PFAS, but TCE, PCE, other volatile organic chemicals and heavy metals were found at high levels um, until the base was deemed to be a Superfund site. So that was the first round of poisoning sustained for me and my family. And then we didn't even know about PFAS until about 18 years later. Um, we not only drank the contaminated water, we brushed our teeth, we swam in it, um, we inhaled it as infants. My mother made our formula with um, poisonous water. In 1990, my father died of cancer at 52. Um, it wasn't just my family, it's many other neighbors passed from cancer and other debilitating diseases well before their time. Three months after burying my father at age 25, I was diagnosed with stage four cancer, which has been a lifelong sentence for me. During my treatments for cancer, doctors repeatedly found other different rare tumors from my body and I had them removed. The military is one of the worst and one of the biggest polluters in our country. Too, too many people have suffered at the hands of the Department of Defense. And I think we need to start to hold them accountable. I've been dealing with this lifelong cancer sentence. Anytime something's wrong with my health, just about anything, I immediately fill with crippling fear about cancer. I've lived my entire life with fears about my exposures to these chemicals and what they've done to my body. Because my, just because my parents bought a home across the street from the Warmster Navy base, I've spent um, exuberant amounts of time and money dealing with health issues, out-of-pocket expenses, I've lost countless years and psychological scars that, that can't be measured, I'm sure, like many of you. Loss of work, loss of family, and loss of loved ones. These things cannot be given back to me. The worst part is my deep-rooted fear, and it turns to guilt, of what I may have exposed my children through to, second-generation health effects from PFAS and other chemical exposures. PFAS passes through the umbilical cord to our children when we're um, pregnant. And what I thought was breast milk nourishing my children, my unborn, my, my, my babies, in fact, was poison. Um, and we're just beginning to learn about some of this stuff. So the knowledge of that, what, what, what does the knowledge of that do to you as a mother, knowing that I could have poisoned my children? Our family suffered a lifelong devastation and we are, we're not alone. There's over, I've heard it mentioned, 85 to 100,000 other people in our local area that have also suffered the same devastation from PFAS. It's sickening for me to learn that the military, and Rob's gonna talk about this, knew for decades about the dangers of PFAS. Chemicals in the firefighting foam and completely disregarded human health as they consciously chose to continue to use these firefighting foams. It was, I was once an innocent child who trusted my parents, my family, my neighborhood, and my government that would protect me and keep me safe. That's not the way I feel today. Um, at Bucksmont Coalition, Joanne and I started it about four years ago. We've connected with about 10,000 community members. We're getting bigger and stronger, and we're happy to assist the community to help share personal stories, community videos, and much more. Today's discussions are critical. They're seriously critical. We've partnered with Temple to try to get some health studies moving along, um, and we're fighting for an MCL, which is a maximum contaminant level for the class of PFAS, and to get it declared a hazardous substance. What can you do to protect yourself? Um, get, get tests, get your water tested, get filtration systems. Um, we as a community, because there's no laws, we, we need to protect ourselves. Know your exposure, you know, get involved in health studies. Um, Pennsylvania has a health study that's going to be on the horizon next year and they're gonna blood test 1,000 adults and 300 children. Um, so be on the lookout for some of that information. It's gonna be the first health study done in our area, which is way, way overdue. And I don't, I just want to um, enforce this even stronger is get involved, volunteer, you know, look around your home, get educated, eliminate things with PFAS in them, know what PFAS is in. The Environmental Working Group, uh, it's ewg.org. They have some amazing sites on PFAS. You just type in PFAS and you're going to see 
a lot of things that you didn't even know about and it's a very informational site. Pressure your elected officials on this issue and let them know that this matters to you. This is an election year. And the, the biggest takeaway I have today is register to vote and go and vote and research who you're voting for because you find out if these candidates are interested in environmental issues and in PFAS and clean water. And I don't wanna minimize um, COVID because I think it's such a big thing, but someone said to me the other day, you know, everything shut down for COVID. Um, and it's pretty interesting to me that we've been drinking polluted water at least my entire life and the world still goes on. And it's kind of made me really stop and think like, what, how, why is this? Well, we kind of know why, but I mean, it's, we as people, as community members need to stand up. And like Al Shapiro said, we have rights to clean water in Pennsylvania. And until we start speaking out and using our voice, um, we need to all stand up together. So thank you all. And um, I appreciate everyone's time and energies. And Rob, thanks for your journey and your story and your movie, because it, I mean, I live it every day. I'm in it fighting for you all, but like sitting and watching that story and seeing your family, like spend all those times and years and watching your kids grow from like little babies to adults. Um, I'm sure that it was a huge um, burden on your life and your family. And I appreciate all that you've done. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Hope. I want to introduce now um, Mr. Robert Bellot. Robert Bellot is a partner at TAF Environmental Litigation, Product Liability, and Personal Injury Groups. For more than 29 years, Rob has handled a wide variety of highly complex environmental matters and raised toxic tort litigation for a diverse array of clients, including the nation's first cases involving PFAS, drinking water, contamination. To date, Rob has secured benefits in excess of $1 billion for clients impacted by PFAS contamination. And through key leadership positions in the nation's first class action, personal injury, medical monitoring, and multi-district litigations and trials. In 2017, Rob received the International Right Livelihood Award, also known as the Alternative Nobel Prize, for his decades of work on PFAS issues. Rob is the author of the book, Exposed Poison Water, Corporate Greed, and One Lawyer's 20-Year Battle Against DuPont. And his story is the inspiration for the motion picture I would imagine most of us watching tonight have seen from participant media and focus features starring Mark Ruflio as Rob. The story is featured in a documentary. It's available on Netflix, Netflix, The Devil We Know. Rob is a graduate of the College of Sarasota, Florida, and has a judicial doctor degree from Ohio State University. Welcome to Pennsylvania, Rob. The floor is yours. Thank you. You know, thank you so much. And I really appreciate the opportunity to speak to everybody uh, tonight. You know, this is really a fantastic uh, event. You know, to, to me, this is exactly what we all need to be doing, which is getting together and talking about this problem. I mean, right now we are, we are all dealing with a massive, in my perspective, worldwide health threat. You know, yes, we're all dealing with uh, the pandemic uh, and the, the issues of the virus right now, but as you just heard, you know, some of our speakers have already mentioned this, you know, these, these issues are not um, <laughs> separate. You know, we're talking about chemicals, man-made toxic chemicals, that are in drinking water all over this country, here in Pennsylvania, in the blood of virtually every living creature on this planet. Uh, these chemicals have been linked to impaired immune response, uh, potentially decreased vaccine response. And you know, this has been going on for 60 or 70 years in this country. Um, and it's only been recently that we're all starting to talk about it. And, um, you know, I, I would really have to thank the folks at Participant Media, Focus Features, Mark Ruffalo in particular, for providing the opportunity to get the story out that you saw in the film Dark Waters or in the, uh, the Netflix uh, film, uh, the documentary, The Double We Know. Um, you know. In order to get the story out to folks about what it took for 
individuals, uh, you know, a cattle farmer in West Virginia uh, to stand up and take on one of the largest chemical companies on the planet uh, and, and lead to essentially everyone on this planet uh, finally learning about this massive health threat. Uh, and the folks in that community that got together and were able to, uh, to come together, provide health data, provide medical information that led to massive health studies that were able to finally confirm uh, the health effects linked to these, these uh, chemicals. And what you see in the film is how long that took. You know, we're talking about a story that started at least for, you know, in this case, we started digging into it in 1998. And it took, you know, almost 20 years to get this information out to the public where we're all now finally learning about this. Um, you know, and, to, and understand that this is not just a situation for one family in West Virginia or one community along the Ohio River. This is affecting all of us. You know, what we saw and what we learned through this, this story was, you know, we've got this, this, uh, this chemical, this whole family of chemicals now, you know, invented right after the war, right after World War II, didn't exist on this planet prior to World War II that are now all over, uh, used in so many different products, so many different processes uh, that they've managed to get into drinking water and blood all over the place. You know, the story you see in Dark Waters and in The Devil We Know, um, you know, focuses on one of these chemicals, PFOA, and shows what it took to get information that was already known to the manufacturers of these chemicals out to the rest of us about the health threat that these chemicals pose and the amount of time that it took and the, the processes and the, the, the hurdles that are in place for the folks who are exposed. You know, for example, you know, we, we, here in, in Pennsylvania, the community that is dealing with exposure to these chemicals is facing this right now, being told that they are essentially the ones who have the burden to come forward and somehow prove how these chemicals are hurting them or causing them harm. Whereas the companies that put these out into the environment knowing they would go out there, knowing for decades that these things would get out, get into our environment, get into us, get into our water, can simply sit back and say, you have to prove that this is causing any harm. And what you see in the film, what you saw in West Virginia was one of the rare times that a community has been able to actually do that, to actually be able to get together get all of this, all these massive studies, all of this massive amount of data together to actually be able to confirm these health effects and actually get compensation and relief. And now what we're learning is PFOA is just one of hundreds if not thousands of chemicals in this big class of PFOS chemicals, all of which share these characteristics of essentially once they get out in the environment, they stay there virtually forever, and they stay in us for long, long periods of time. But as we're learning about more and more of these chemicals, particularly one of them that's related called PFOS that was used extensively in firefighting foams, particularly outside military bases and airports uh, that are now being found in drinking water, as in Pennsylvania. What we are now hearing is <laughs> we don't know enough information. There's not enough known about the health effects. We need to study, we need to, we need to slow down and spend more time trying to gather more information. We just don't know enough yet to take action. It's not correct. What we see in the film, what you see in Dark Waters, what I try to, 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 to explain in, in great detail in the book, Exposure, is how much we do know, how much has been known about these chemicals for decades and decades, and frankly was simply covered up and withheld from the rest of us and how much we know about the health threat and how that is more than sufficient for us to move forward now and take action now. Um, and what we're seeing all across the country is as, as people finally start to learn about these exposures. You know, and, and a lot of folks like in Pennsylvania didn't start learning about these until the last five or six years or even more recently than that. And it's not because these exposures weren't happening before then. It's simply that the testing didn't begin. Sampling only recently started. These exposures and this, these chemicals have likely been in our water and our blood for decades. But as we're finally starting to learn about this, what we're hearing once again is we just don't know enough. We need to slow down. We need to, we need to know more about it. 
uh, but we know more than enough, frankly, from what was done with one of these chemicals, PFOA, and the characteristics that are shared among all of these chemicals in this class to be taking action. And I'm hoping that people are inspired when they see the film um, and they look at the situation in West Virginia to know that it can be done. You know, it is a hard, difficult road to, to get this uh, to get this information out and to get enough data collected so that we can move forward and start uh, taking action, setting regulations, adopting standards, adopting rules. Um, and it's there now. And as you've seen uh, across the country, there are actions being taken by a number of states, you've heard about it already tonight, that are setting actually enforceable drinking water standards. We're working with, with states and water providers all over the country trying to help, trying to get it out as much information as we can. Uh, and these big groups that are here tonight that have been doing a fabulous job doing that as well, particularly in Pennsylvania. And I know Tracy you know, was one of the ones who first got the information out back in 2006 about these chemicals being in the water in New Jersey, you know, which led to standards finally coming out and guidelines in New Jersey. This is what it takes. It takes information like this, people getting together, having these forum, talking about it, actually you know, uh, understanding where we've been, no. what's been known, and where we're going from this, uh, this, page, uh, this step forward. So I really appreciate the opportunity for all of us to get together tonight. I'm looking forward to talking with folks uh, and answering any questions you may have. I know I've probably talked way too long, but uh, again, uh, you know, having, having events like this where we can get together and share information, share experiences, learn from what has already happened and, and move forward from there. Uh, and and I, now's the time to act. And I appreciate all of those of you that are here tonight that support those kind of efforts and um, happy to, to do what we can to work with you to, to move things forward. So thank you. Thank you, Rob. What we wanna do now is go into the um, panel format for this event. I've been watching the questions and I've noted that they are pretty much all over the block. Um, our anticipation is, is that um, you will have lots of questions for um, Rob and Tracy and also for Hope. But I have noted that uh, just about all of our speakers are still on the line. So I want to introduce uh, Bree Hashman, who is a colleague in Clean Water Action, who will um, moderate here. Um, the questions that you have been um, loading have been um, reviewed, and um, if all goes as we have planned it here, um, um, I would hope that uh, Bree is ready to offer her first question. So Bree, please take it away. Yeah, so our first question comes from Anne Makowski. Um, she asks, a very good question. Why doesn't the EPA set the standard for PFAS instead of leaving it up to the states? Uh, so I don't know if uh, Attorney General uh, Shapiro wants to answer that or Rob Balot or Hope. Well, I'm happy to jump in. I don't mean to step on any, any toes, but I just, just to give you some history, just just to keep in mind, you know, uh, I think I sent a letter to the US EPA on March 6th of 2001 asking that um, actually enforceable drinking water standards be set at the federal level. Um, and, you know, it's, believe it or not, we are still sitting here in the year 2020 without any federally enforceable drinking water standard for PFOA or any of these PFOS chemicals. Um, and for many years, what we heard was, well, you know, there's the science is still out. We don't know enough yet. You know, even though there was plenty of animal data, well, we just don't have human data. Well, then we'll be pointed to all the worker data. Well, we don't have any data about communities that have been exposed. So then when we did that big study you saw in the film with 70,000 people, we said, okay, now we should have enough to go forward. And what we saw is that really... We finally at least got that finally triggered EPA to finally go out and start requiring testing and sampling. And we're just now sort of beginning this regulatory process where the EPA is hoping they might set a standard. And what we're seeing is our states are saying we need to move forward and actually um, take steps quicker than that. 
uh, to try to address this because we just don't know when EPA will ever move forward. It's a very long, slow, tedious process with a lot of hoops and a lot of hurdles. I would just add that um, the EPA has not adopted a new drinking water standard for any chemical since 1996. And, you know, they really have taken a back seat in terms of regulating chemicals in our drinking water. And that's why states have safe drinking water acts that they've adopted, you know, based on the federal act. And that's why states have been able to move forward with safe drinking water standards based on what they're finding um, within their own state. And I think all of us agree that the only just thing to do is to have a standard that's federal, at least a minimum standard. So those states that are never gonna take that action, uh, the people will still have um, protection. Um, but with a in the absence of uh, adoption of any standards by the federal government, particularly under this administration, there's been um, you know, really no movement except some public relations. Um, we really have to have the state step up and do what they need to do. It's one of the reasons that some of these, some states and Pennsylvania has been dragging behind because of this too, states have never taken that role before. So um, I think what we've learned in recent years is that protection has to be provided uh, to the public by the entities that will step up and do it. And in this case, it's the states and hopefully someday there will be a minimum standard uh, at the federal level, and the states can have even stricter standards than that, um, you know, based on their, their own findings within their jurisdiction. Thank you, Rob and Tracy, for that. Um, our next question is coming from Brian McHugh. Um, how could we compel large chemical companies or fossil fuel companies to behave in a more environmentally friendly manner? It's clear that they often follow the regulations that there are, so is there a carrot for honest self-reporting? Um, I don't know if Attorney General uh, Shapiro is still here, um, uh, or any of the local legislators, uh, Balad. Rob, I'll, I'll choose you for it to give the answer then. <laughs> well, you know, one thing I would say, and I, I didn't mention this in my remarks, but, um, you know, it's, it's incredibly important that the entities that cause this problem be the ones that are held responsible and be the ones paying these costs. You know, we're looking at incredible costs uh, to, to, to address this contamination, you know, to do the sampling to do, uh, just to go out and collect the data about the public water, um, you know, to, to, to try to deal then with the contamination that we find across the state when you start doing sampling. And um, the entities that put this stuff out into our environment, the ones who made it and released it, knowing this, they should be paying for that. Um, and, you know, we're, these are completely man-made chemicals that have a chemical signature and fingerprint back to those companies who made them. It's not like, you know, things like lead or arsenic where you, where you find it out in the environment. Well, it might've come from here, it might've come from there. We know where this stuff came from and we know who should be held responsible for when we find it in our water, when we find it in our soils. And um, what we're seeing, uh, you know, a lot of folks are, are trying to make sure that those parties are held responsible. Um, and, you know, unfortunately, as you heard before, there's, um, uh, problem with the way uh, the liability rules are under a lot of the federal statutes. Um, and there are really a lot of folks that are trying to take steps right now to make sure that uh, those loopholes are plugged and that steps can be taken by the states, by the water providers, by communities, by residents to make sure that the taxpayers and their individuals aren't paying those costs. Companies should be paying that. Thank you for that answer. Um, so our next question comes from Allison Zekman. Um, I think this would be good for hope. Uh, can private citizens get their water tested for PFAS if they have public drinking water? I cannot find any data on PFAS in my city. So it really depends where you live. Um, 
we are fortunate where we live in Bucks and Montgomery County that, um, for instance, Horsham has done an amazing job at cleaning up the water and they didn't have to, um, but they did it. And it's, it's probably one of the cleanest waters out there in Horsham. Um, so depending on your township or your water supplier, you, you would need to contact them. But we can go back around to this again, is there is not a law for PFAS and it is not regulated. So they are not liable to give you any information because it's, they don't have to. So that's why we are all here pushing hard to get legislation for the state of Pennsylvania as other states have already done. Michigan just did it. Um, I believe it was New York's done it, there, New Jersey's done it. There's plenty of states that have pushed through this and got these legal limits set up so that you don't have to worry about it. Um, it it's hard, it's a hard question to answer because you can get your water tested. I'm gonna drop a link in here to a couple labs locally in Horsham and um, Warminster and that you can use but it's a cost to you, unfortunately, because our federal government isn't moving quick enough. Thank you for that, Hope. Um, so our next question is from Merle Plotkin. Um, this might be good for Senator Collette or Representative Stevens. Do we have a plan moving forward on the amount of PFAS in our water systems? What are the companies that you recommend for testing our water in Warrington? So, well, Warrington is not in my <laughs> district, so I'll defer to Senator Collette on that or Hope or whoever's got that information. Yeah, and I would say that to the first part of the question about what we're gonna do in terms of levels, I mean, I think you heard Representative Stevens, you heard, uh, Tracy, myself, uh, Mr. Balot, we all were talking about that MCL and how critical it is, how important it absolutely is that, um, you know, we have an MCL so we know what acceptable levels for our drinking water are going to be. Uh, right now, all we have is that 70 part per trillion health advisory limit. So right now, that's what, um, you know, people are sort of testing to see where they fall in that range. How far above it are they? Are they far below it? So these are things that are really important. If you have a private well, um, we may be able to connect you to military for testing information. Um, other than that, we might be able to uh, connect you. I think Hope uh, is still on the call, but we might be able to connect you to some other company uh, if you call the office uh, and we can help you with figuring out who the best people are for testing. But, um, you know, I think unfortunately what you heard Hope saying earlier is true that it's going to come at a cost to you. So that's part of what we're really uh, concerned about, making sure that we are getting people um, people's water tested effectively, um, but without having to incur too much cost to themselves. So it's something that we can definitely, um, you know, help point you in the right direction of, but ultimately uh, as the homeowner or the well owner, it's gonna be up to you to, to um, bear the burden of that testing. Uh, I would just add one thing. Um, thank you, Maria. Um, that in terms of a plan or a process, there is a process set up um, under Pennsylvania Safe Drinking Water Act. Um, the Environmental Quality Board does the research and makes a recommendation to the DEP. And then the DEP promulgates or puts out there a rulemaking, a proposed rulemaking to set a drinking water standard. And that process is set up in order to provide uh, a way that dangerous contaminants can be removed from our water. The problem is Pennsylvania um, it has not taken those steps that they should have taken. Um, they are doing sampling. They have a plan, uh, a sampling plan. But as you uh, probably heard me say earlier, we're very critical of that plan and they've totally fallen down on it. Um, they were supposed to have completed the sampling last month and be on to another phase and we haven't heard anything but one report on only 96 samples that have been taken out of the hundreds that are supposed to be. So things are just stuck in Pennsylvania. And there really is a process that can be kicked into action if the state wants to do it. It's really a, 
almost a political matter. Uh, I hate to use that word, but I don't mean it in terms of, you know, partisan politics. But I mean, it's a bottom up people saying to the DEP, this is what we want. We want th these toxic compounds removed from our drinking water. And we want a law that makes it mandatory that this happen. And the only way you can really do that is going through that process that's set up in the state statute and then promulgating the rulemaking. But they can do it. There's an answer. Thank you, Tracy. Um, this next question is for uh, Rob Blot. Um, in Dark Waters and in your book, Exposure, you talk about PFAS chemical C8, but after 2006, they started manufacturing PFAS chemicals they call C6, and it turns out those are toxic as well. How does that change your ability to hold polluters accountable? Well, it's a great question, and I think that really highlights the, the problem we have. And one of the things I really try to explore more in the book is just the systemic problem in, we have with the way our legal system um, is set up and you know, the way it cor corresponds with the existing regulatory systems and the system for the way in which science is generated and published and comes out. Um, you know, for example, we had, we had took all of this time to get the data out to the public and to the rest of the world about the harms from PFOA, C8, the one that had the eight carbon, um, and the related one, PFOS, which is also a C8, because they each have eight carbons. Once that data finally came out, and it took all of those years to get that out to the public and to the regulators and for folks to start finally saying these prevent, uh, present health risks, those two start getting phased out or banned internationally or there's voluntary phase outs. And what happens is then the company started switching to essentially these replacement chemicals that maybe had a couple of fewer carbons on them, things like C6s or C4s. And then under our regulatory system, and I'm oversimplifying, <laughs> and our legal system, those are viewed as completely different chemicals. So all of that data we had amassed about C8 and all of those human health studies that have been done that showed and confirmed the links between C8 and these adverse health effects, once we started learning that the C6s, things like Gen X, DuPont's replacement for PFOA, once we started finding those in drinking water, like down in Wilmington, North Carolina, what we heard is, oh, well, there's no data. All of the data we had was on C8, and none of that applies to C6. And so it's almost as if you got to start all over again. And this process goes back to square one, where we have to start generating all that same kind of data again, because this is a different new chemical. So what you're really seeing now among the scientific and regulatory community are folks saying, we need to find a different way to address chemicals. We can't be doing them one at a time, taking 20 to 30 years to amass this wealth of information, including community studies, and then finally doing something about it, and then starting all over again, once you tweak one little chemical, we need to address these as a class uh, and to take all the, co the, the chemicals that share common characteristics and try to deal with it in a comprehensive way once we know there are health threats from chemicals within that class. So there's a big debate going on, and I know others on the panel here probably know more about that or can speak better about it, but uh, a lot of that is just because <laughs> You know, it's, it's almost impossible then to, to move through the regulatory system or the legal system and to, the, when, you, when you just keep tweaking the chemical slightly and starting all over again. Um, so it's a real problem and it's a, it's a real systemic problem um, and one hopefully, once we all know about it and see what's happening, we can see there's a way to fix it. Thank you for that excellent answer. Um, this. Uh, next question is from Linda Letty. Um, this would be best for Tracy. Uh, is there a process available to clean up the contamination? Yes, and as a matter of fact, um, any state that has adopted 
a safe drinking water standard has done their due diligence and investigated how to treat water to remove it because you can't make a law that then you can't enforce because there's no treatment techniques. So a granular activated carbon, reverse osmosis, there's different measures that are being used, but yes, um, they are effective. They're some uh, treatment methods are more effective for what they call the long chain, like Rob was describing the C8 being long chain, C9, PFNA is a long chain. These long chain, uh, carbon chain uh, PFAS compounds tend to be more effectively removed by GAC, but there even are some replacements um, that have been um, replacing the use of the PFAS compounds that were phased out that are removed by granular activated carbon too. So we, we do know that it, it is effective, it's affordable, um, it's being used in many states. Um, in, in New Jersey, uh, they actually installed GAC you know, back as long ago as 2007 you know, to remove PFAS in some water systems on a voluntary basis. So, um, yes, that's, that's an important way to remove it from your drinking water. But I think the other side of this question that maybe the, the questioner is thinking of is, how do you get it out of the environment? And, you know, removing it from our drinking water is absolutely essential and it's the first priority. It's what we should do in order to protect people's health. But we also need to get it out of the environment or else we'll forever be just treating our water and then having this residue that we have to get rid of. And then how do you get rid of that? Um, there's different methods that are being used that are considered very dangerous, such as incineration. Um, but there are ways that are, and there's been a tremendous um, galloping forward of the various um, methods that are being used to d destroy or break down these compounds, which, you know, because they're called forever chemicals, it's not easy. But there are ways that are being discovered now of um, actually helping these components break down into non-toxic components. So the science is moving ahead on that. Um, and, but in terms of cleanup, uh, what they basically do is pump and treat. They pump the groundwater, uh, for instance, beneath the military bases and they treat it. Um, they put it through a, a GAC a treatment system, which removes the PFOS and the PFOA. Um, and then um, that water is re either re-injected or sent off to the surface. There's no perfect answer to this question, but there, there are answers um, and all of them have you know, a certain uh, downside to them, but they, they are being used and there is water being delivered, for instance, as Hope described, in Horsham Township that is PFAS free. There is water that was contaminated that has none in it. And that is also true for New Jersey where they adopted PFNA several years back and now have adopted the PFOA and PFOS maximum contaminant levels. And there is water delivered with none, totally non-detect of any of those in that water. So it is being used um, and it is, you know, it's, it's not rocket science. It's, it's something that actually has been used for many years. It's just being improved to address the various, uh, you know, hundreds of compounds in their, their you know, uh, idiosyncratic uh, properties. Thank you, Tracy. Um, we've got four minutes left, so we'll try just one more question. Um, this is from Barbara Hockma. Uh, I was not aware of the PFOS contamination issue in PA before today. Um, what can be done to make this issue high profile in PA media outlets to educate the public? Have any PA communities taken legal action similar to what Rob did in West Virginia to break the logjam of responsibility? I uh, hope you might be a good person to answer this or, or Representative Stevens. Todd, I'm giving this to you. You're awfully quiet over there. Yeah. Sorry. No problem. Um, and so the question, you know, I heard the first part of the question I was breaking up a little on the second. I heard this is the first time that they heard about PFAS um, in Pennsylvania. And, and they want to know what they can do to, to elevate this and the, the radar for everybody. Yep. Yeah. I mean, Look, I learned about it because Tracy Carluccio, you know, called my office, set up a, a time to meet with me, and we sat in my conference room, and 
she unloaded a ton of information on me. And um, I, I honestly, like, I, I'll never forget. It was, um, I forget what day of the week it was, but that night I was l literally watching a Flyers game and it must've been a boring game because I had my iPad there. And I started Googling around some of the links that she told me to check out. And, um, and I just kept down this rabbit hole where, you know, more and more information. I thought, holy cow, we have to do something about this. And so, you know, arm yourself with good information. Um, there are a ton of resources out there. And, you know, th this panel uh, has just some terrific people that have a, a wealth of information on this subject and can point you towards some really compelling information and make an appointment and sit down with your legislator. You know, one of the sad realities of this situation is there are a lot of people in Pennsylvania who are drinking contaminated water and have no idea that they're drinking it. Um, I happen to have been out, I guess it uh, might have been two years ago, on a tour uh, out at the Pittsburgh airport. And they were, I was there because they were showing us a brand new terminal out there. And um, you know, they were talking about all the economic development that was gonna result from the terminal. And I saw an air guard station out there and I saw a firefighter training school out there. And I just happened to ask, and I, was, I remember I was on a bus full of legislators, and I said, do you guys have a PFAS problem out here? And um, they said, it's funny you should ask that. They just told us that we do, but we don't really know what that is. And I said, well, you're, you're gonna find out pretty soon. And um, you know, so people, you know, until, until it's discovered, and you know, it's not discovered until someone looks for it, but when someone looks for it and then they find it, that's when communities learn all about it. And unfortunately, it's not until then that re people really take action. So, um, you know, I would get armed with the information about the experiences of all these other communities, um, you know, all the work that Rob did, um, you know, the work that's going on that Hope's doing and, and Joanne and, uh, and Tracy uh, down here in the Delaware Valley. I mean, there's a lot of examples, sadly, locally um, of, uh, of the impact. And so, I think when you share that information, you start to get people's attention and that's what's gonna move the needle for policymakers. Thank you, Representative Stevens. Um, that answer is a perfect transition um, to hear from Tom Cicino, who's the Lower Bucks Coordinator for Conservation Voters of PA, um, to talk about just how necessary citizen engagement is on this issue. So pass it over to Tom. Thanks, Brianna. Uh, as, as you said, my name is Tom Sassino. I'm the Lower Bucks Coordinator for Conservation Voters of PA. We're a statewide voice that looks to advocate for sound environmental policies, elevate the work of our environmental activists in the area, as well as endorse and elect environmental champions all across the state. Before I speak, I do also want to introduce uh, Rachel Rosenfeld. Hi everyone, thanks for joining us this evening. Um, as Tom said, my name is Rachel Rosenfeld and I'm the Community Outreach Coordinator for the Sierra Club Pennsylvania chapter. We are a people-powered statewide environmental organization focused on exploring, enjoying, and protecting our environment and fighting for safe, livable conditions in our communities. We believe our open spaces, clean water, and natural resources should be protected so that current and future generations may enjoy them. And now I'll hand it back to Tom to talk a little bit about what we're proposing to do going forward. Thank you. Um, and I just want to take one second to thank all of our speakers who came on with us tonight. Uh, we're so privileged to be joined with all of you tonight to hear from you about your experiences and the work that you do. Um, once again tonight, you know, we've all unfortunately seen how PFOS contamination has impacted our country put the health of communities at risk, and yet we're still waiting on our leaders to take action. In the midst of a global pandemic and a revitalized commitment to creating a more equ equitable world, the need for clean water could not be more essential. Um, access to clean running water for drinking and hand washing is a crucial element to protecting households and our communities from the spread of disease. PFAS contamination has required people to live in fear every time they turn their tap on, and communities are afraid of what will happen to themselves and their families and are often left on their own to solve these issues. Just this week, The Intercept ran a um, report saying that people who were exposed to PFAS um, 
might experience worsened conditions if exposed and contracted uh, COVID-19. This is an issue that really demands our full attention, really our anger and a determination to take action from this moment forward. Now that we know what's at stake, we can't sit idle and it's time for us to start demanding clean, uh, clean water and to protect our resources. And I will hand it back over to Rachel. Yeah, so we've talked a lot about PFAS and what that stands for. It's a complicated term, um, but they are essentially often called forever chemicals um, because they persist in our environment and our bodies for so long. Uh, it's estimated that these chemicals are in 99% of people's blood. Uh, they've been linked to serious health issues, including some cancers, compromised immune systems, thyroid problems, and low birth weights in infants, and can be found in some firefighting foams and used widely in our common household products like cleaners and nonstick cookware. And I've seen in the chat, we're talking a lot about Teflon. So we wanna mention that that is a, con a big concern. Um, but due to these serious concerns, uh, that's why we're asking that after this important community conversation, everyone will take some time to reach out to Governor Wolf's office to express the urgency of this issue and push for a Pennsylvania specific statewide water quality standard that will aim to remove all toxic PFAS chemicals from our environment. We will be following up with each of you to provide all of the information you need to take action with us and to strengthen our demand to safeguard our drinking water supplies. So be looking for a message in your inbox next week. Thank you to everyone who has joined us tonight for this important discussion. When we join together on these type of issues, we can win. Don't forget to keep an eye on your inboxes and reach out to Governor Wolf. Now we'll throw it back to Maurice for closing comments. Thank you, everyone. I, I want to um, express real gratitude in the partners who uh, put this together, um, Delaware River um, Network, Conservation Voters of Pennsylvania, the Sierra Club, um, the uh, Bucksmont Citizens for Clean Water. Um, when we work together, as Rachel said, that is when we win. It's been an interesting experience all working together. Our organizations share in common that we are on the ground, that this is the work that we do and we do it through our members. Those of you here came through various sponsors that essentially you are members of the various organizations that are you see represented here. This is the kind of work that we do. It's not just you're getting your mailbox full of emails um, asking for money. There's real work that's going on here. And the truth of the matter is, we cannot do this and we can't succeed without you doing this. It sounds momentous, it sounds overwhelming. It is large, it is whelming, but it's something that we can do if we do it together. As Rachel said, you are going to be getting emails um, they will come from the organizations that sponsored you here. We are going to be working together on this level to figure out what needs to be done, but we absolutely need you if this is going to make the difference that it needs to make. We need to start moving at lightning speed. You know, um, I want to say there's bad news and good news, and I have to be saying, my God, how much more bad news can there be? But I have to tell you, we've been talking about PFOS in water. PFOS is not only in water. PFOS goes someplace, it's in those products. And when it gets burned, it goes into the air. And when it goes into the air, it comes down in the rain, and it comes down everywhere. PFOS is in the rivers. The Philadelphia Water Department, I understand, will soon release a report of what they found in the river outside and inside their intake. But they told me the good news was it's not as high as the federal minimum levels. I don't know what that means, but stay tuned. But it does mean that it's not just in Bucks and Montgomery County, that all of us are consuming it in one form or another. We need to get rid of this stuff. We need not only to talk about how we get rid of it in our water, we've got to start getting it out of the products 
that we buy. We don't even know what products that it is in. There is a lot of work to be done here and we need you to do it. I wanna thank all of you for taking the time um, to come out tonight. You know, I failed to say that um, who clean water is, who clean water action is. Um, our mission is to work to help develop strong environmental leadership and to bring together diverse constituencies to work cooperatively for changes that improve lives focused on health, consumer, environment, community problems. Our role as facilitator in helping to pull this together really reflects who we are as an organization. Thank you very much, Hope, for what you're doing. Thanks for keeping on. It would be so easy to be affected by this as you are and to simply willow away in depression and, and leave it alone. But it's really your courage and your being here that inspires the rest of us to, to do what it is that we do. And we need you help, so hang on and uh, keep punching. And we're punching with you. I wanna thank everybody for uh, joining us here tonight. There were almost 200 of us at one point um, on the line. That's very encouraging. Um, I see the numbers starting to drop, which tells me it's time to go. So please be safe, have a good evening, watch your email, and we'll see you all real soon. See you later.